A team of astrophysicists is returning from a journey to a faraway galaxy. They were sent there to investigate the causes of a supernova. What they discovered there and how they grapple with that discovery on the return journey home is the centerpiece of The Star, Arthur C. Clarke's 1955 Hugo Award-winning short story. I put a link to the story in the show notes. It's only four pages long, and you could probably read it in a couple of minutes, so I recommend you do that, because although the story is not very long, it says a lot about some important historical and philosophical principles, including the history of the battle between science and faith, the philosophical problem of evil, ideas about civilization and collapse, and more. The story opens with a Jesuit scientist of some sort who is returning from that mission to a faraway galaxy where he's discovered something that's led to a crisis of faith. As a religious man and a man of God and a member of that religious order, he feels that he's made a particular scientific discovery that throws his faith out of whack. The astrophysicist narrator says, quote, Once, I believed that space could have no power over faith, just as I believed the heavens declared the glory of God's handiwork. Now I have seen that that handiwork and my faith is sorely troubled. End quote. So right away we're introduced to this idea that science and faith can be at odds with one another. There's an idea that scientific progress might create issues for religious beliefs and institutions. Science might contradict certain teachings in religious holy books, or scientific progress might offer an alternative to religious stories and practices. And the narrator mentions how this conflict has played out over the course of history. You can look at the Inquisition or the trial of Galileo or really any number of these issues where it seems like religion and science have this conflict. And there's no doubt that historically blood has been spilled in this realm. But it's not just the moments of conflict between science and faith, but also the ways in which they interact with each other over the course of history. I've been reading about the various plagues in ancient Rome, the plague of Antonine and Cyprian and Justinian, and the ways in which those scientific realities were filtered through religious systems and institutions and belief systems. As the narrator of the story points out, there is this intimate connection between science and religion. And believe it or not, historically, men of religion have contributed much to science. And in the narrator of the story's opinion, perhaps ironically. At any rate, the Jesuit astrophysicist is returning from something called the Phoenix Nebula. The phoenix, of course, being a symbol of hope and new beginnings and rising from the ashes. And the mission was to go to the supernova of this exploded star and figure out what happened. The narrator describes his mission, saying, quote, Our mission was to visit the remnants of such a catastrophe to reconstruct the events that led up to it, and if possible, to learn its cause. End quote. 
as he points out, all stars have a life cycle. And towards the end of that life cycle, eventually all stars will basically blow up and collapse in on themselves. And the narrator describes what he saw once his crew got to the Phoenix Nebula. He says, quote, Once it had been a sun like our own, but it had squandered in a few hours the energy that should have kept it shining for a million years. Now it was a shrunken miser, hoarding its resources as if trying to make amends for its prodigal youth. End quote. Much like the life cycle of the star, perhaps his description here is a metaphor for the institutional and systematic and personal collapse that awaits us all, eventually. But upon arriving at the destination, the scientific crew discovers something unexpected. On a Pluto-like planet, far enough from the exploded star not to be totally destroyed, they find a vault. It turns out there was life in this galactic system, but it was extinguished by the heat death of the sun. A lost civilization burning up in a fiery supernova. But knowing the supernova was coming, this civilization was able to stash everything important about it, or at least some of the things important to it, in a vault on this faraway planet where potentially it might survive for future discovery. The narrator says, quote, A civilization that knew it was about to die had made its last bid for immortality. It will take us generations to examine all the treasures that were placed in the vault. They had plenty of time to prepare, for their sun must have given its first warnings many years before the final detonation. Everything that they wished to preserve, all the fruits of their genius, they brought here to this distant world in the days before the end, hoping that some other race would find it and that they would not be utterly forgotten. Would we have done as well? Or would we have been too lost in our own misery to give thought to a future we could never see or share? End quote. So the life forms in this civilization knew the end was coming, and there was nothing they could do to stop it. So they decide to put the things that mean the most to them in this vault, hoping that eventually something or someone discovers it, and their civilization, their way of life, their beings aren't totally forgotten. A sad and yet somewhat beautiful way to prepare for the end. The narrator describes what he sees in the vault. He says, quote, Even if they had not been so disturbingly human as their sculpture shows, we could not have helped admiring them and grieving for their fate. They left thousands of visual records and the machines for projecting them, together with elaborate pictorial instructions from which it will not be difficult to learn their written language. We have examined many of these records and brought to life for the first time in 6,000 years the warmth and beauty of a civilization that in many ways must have been superior to our own. Perhaps they only showed us the best, and one can hardly blame them, but their worlds were very lovely, and their cities were built with a grace that matches anything of man's. We have watched them at work and play and listened to their musical speech sounding across the centuries. One scene is still before my eyes, a group of children on a beach of strange blue sand playing in the waves as children play on earth. Curious whip-like trees line the shore, and some very large animal is wading in the shallows, yet attracting no attention at all. And sinking into the sea, 
still warm and friendly and life-giving, is the sun that will soon turn traitor and obliterate all this innocent happiness. End quote. To me, this idea of a vault is an interesting thought experiment. If you knew the exact day and time that you were going to die, how would you deal with that? Would it change the way you live your life at all? What about you would you want to live on long after you were gone? How would you make sure that whatever that is, it gets put into place? What if everybody knew this was going to happen at a certain time? Everybody knew this supernova was going to happen. How would we handle this as a society? Perhaps everyone could upload a certain amount of data, maybe videos or photos that are important to you, maybe books or movies or science fiction short stories. Probably not many physical possessions could make the journey from Earth to Pluto to be stashed in this vault. So my guess would be it would have to be some sort of server or something with enough data to hold whatever we thought was important. Would there be a cap on total data per person? Who gets to decide what information becomes immortal? to be discovered by the next civilization to come along in the future. As the narrator is going through the items in the vault, and as he's looking at the videos and looking at the photos of this beautiful and wondrous civilization, and as he's watching these innocent kids playing on the beach with their families and the inherent joy and goodness of that, and as he's realizing that that inherent goodness is about to be totally obliterated by the heat death of the galaxy, his religious faith is brought into question. How could the destruction of something so beautiful and so seemingly noble happen? He's questioning why. He says, quote, This tragedy was unique. It is one thing for a race to fail and die, as nations and cultures have done on Earth, but to be destroyed so completely in the full flower of its achievement, leaving no survivors. How could that be reconciled with the mercy of God? They could have taught us much. Why were they destroyed? End quote. This question of why, I think, is important to anyone who's made a commitment to shouldering the burden of history. Because when you're making that commitment to learning about history, it can take a toll. Oftentimes, you're sifting through unpleasantness and atrocities from the past in order to learn and hopefully understand and prepare for the present and the future. But oftentimes that question of why is still lingering there. If only things could have turned out differently, if only this thing was different or that thing was different, perhaps untold suffering could have been avoided. Sometimes it's hard not to think that way. So you can appreciate the narrator of the story having this crisis of faith where He's questioning how this incredible and beautiful civilization could be destroyed so easily. And this question of why brings us to what's known in philosophy as the problem of evil. The problem of evil is the problem of, if you are a religious person, how you reconcile the existence of God with the existence of evil. So, sort of the basic version of it that gets dissected in every Philosophy 101 class across the globe goes something like this. A description of God usually requires three things. That God is all-knowing, 
all-powerful and all-good. The problem is then, how and why does evil exist, which it clearly does, in a universe where God exists? No being that is all-good could allow for evil. A being that is all-powerful should be able to stop evil easily. And a being that's all-knowing would, of course, know that this evil exists. And how is that reconciled with the fact that the being is all-good? So it's basically saying, if God is so good and powerful, then why does evil exist? A counter to this line of thinking might be something along the lines of free will needs to exist in order for good to exist. A counter to the counter might say, fine, but what about naturally occurring evil? What about hurricanes and supernovas and the heat death of galaxies? What sense does that make? Surely God could remove those evils that have nothing to do with free will. And the counter to that might be something along the lines of humans just fundamentally not being able to understand a divine essence or whatever the case may be, and the debate would go on from there. And I'm sure the debate has gone on from there in many a Philosophy 101 classroom. And I actually think that a lot of people tend to write off the problem of evil as nothing more than philosophy 101, pointlessness, and pretentiousness. For what it's worth, I think the problem of evil is interesting to think about for a lot of reasons, and some of those reasons this story demonstrates. Thinking about the problem of evil brings out these interesting themes and tensions between science and religion, and these themes of destruction and rebirth, and the meaning of civilization and collapse. These are all ideas that history is filled with. So for what it's worth, I think it's an interesting problem to think about, and I'm sure Arthur C. Clarke would agree. Now, at any rate, back to the story, the narrator is going through this problem of evil debate in his head. How do you reconcile a good God with the total obliteration of this beautiful civilization? The narrator is going through the reasoning of both sides, and you can sense his doubt and turmoil and confusion. He says, quote, Why were they destroyed? I know the answers that my colleagues will give when they get back to Earth. They will say that the universe has no purpose and no plan, that since a hundred suns explode every year in our galaxy, at this very moment some race is dying in the depths of space. Whether that race has done good or evil during its lifetime will make no difference in the end. There is no divine justice, for there is no God. Yet, of course, what we have seen proves nothing of the sort. Anyone who argues thus is being swayed by emotion, not logic. God has no need to justify his actions to man. He who built the universe can destroy it when he chooses. It is arrogance, it is perilously near blasphemy for us to say what he may or may not do. End quote. On the journey home from the Phoenix Nebula, The narrator is going through this crisis of faith, but in the end, his faith is ultimately broken. And it's not by science or rational arguments, but by a coincidence. And it's by the coincidence of when the supernova that he just visited was visible on Earth. So presumably at some point, the supernova where the civilization explodes and is destroyed takes many, many thousands of years for that light to reach Earth where it is visible. And it's the exact moment where he traces that that supernova was visible on Earth that causes his faith to break. He says, quote, 
there can be no reasonable doubt. The ancient mystery is solved at last. Yet, oh God, there were so many stars you could have used. What was the need to give these people to the fire, that the symbol of their passing might shine above Bethlehem? End quote. For those that don't know, there's a Christian story of the three wise men who are being guided by a star to the birth of Jesus at Bethlehem, where they're going to give him three gifts. So in that religious view, the star that's guiding the three wise men to Jesus is sort of a symbol of hope. But for the narrator, it turns out that that symbol of hope was a lie. It was nothing more than the last visible remnants of the death and suffering of millions and a once beautiful civilization. This shocking revelation ultimately breaks the narrator's faith and ends the story. And these kinds of twist endings are famous in science fiction short stories, and they're just cool. They give the story rereadability and oftentimes a twist in the last paragraph or the last sentence can change the meaning of previous events in the story and make you want to go back and read it again. But in this case, I also think it's interesting because for the two main themes of the story, science versus faith and the problem of evil, I think the revelation at the end probably shows that the author, Arthur C. Clarke, is someone who, at least for the purposes of this story, leans towards the more science, more atheist view. But I think, interestingly, he doesn't close the door to the other side. Remember, it wasn't science, and it wasn't some sort of scientific, logical argument that convinces the narrator that the problem of evil can't be reconciled. It was that coincidence that the star of Bethlehem actually turned out to be the death throes of this civilization. And maybe inside of that coincidence, there is some sort of mercurial divine plan. Maybe it does represent some sort of phoenix rising from the ashes. Maybe the star of Bethlehem represents a new beginning from a religious perspective. Maybe there's this yin and yang as the ashes of the old burn out and the fires of the new begin to burn brightly. Or maybe not. So at the end of the day, I think some might see this story as a little bit sad and depressing, but I think it gives you plenty of questions to think on. And I think that's what this story does without necessarily giving you the answers. A good story keeps an open mind. I think that's something we all need these days. And as the great Brandon Sanderson once said, the purpose of a storyteller is not to tell you how to think, but to give you questions to think upon. Right, so I haven't checked in after a podcast in a while here, and I just want to say thanks for everybody who's out there listening. I really do appreciate it. I know a lot of people are going through some tough times these days, and the fact that you're willing to give the podcast a listen and give it your attention and time and all that stuff really does mean a lot. If you're interested in supporting the podcast, we do have the Patreon page going. You can get access to some bonus stuff like monthly newsletter and recommendations, bonus episodes, which people seem to be liking, I think. I think we're up to 10 bonus episodes now. Uh, We've talked about a whole bunch of different stuff, history stuff, um, Howard Zinn. We talked about Dan Carlin. We did some philosophy stuff. Um movies. We talked about Edge of Tomorrow, uh, one of my favorite movies. 
Harry Potter and history, some of the connections between the books and history. Just did one on William Faulkner's The Bear, one of my favorite short stories and sort of how that connects with Manifest Destiny and different ways of looking at American values. And I've been working on more bonus stuff in honor of Christopher Nolan's Tenet, which apparently now may never be released, but whatever. We're going to have a Christopher Nolan extravaganza, so look out for that. I think it's going to be good. The link to the Patreon is in the description. If you want to go there and support that way, check it out. If you don't want to do that or you can't, that's totally fine too. There's other ways you can support. You can leave reviews on Apple Podcasts, iTunes. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you're listening to it on. You can subscribe on Spotify. A lot of people listening on Spotify these days, which is cool. Subscribing to the YouTube page. All of these things are stuff you can do that I am very much appreciative of, and I definitely am thankful to everybody listening. It's been cool to talk to many of you on Twitter or over email as well. That's it for me. Thanks for listening.